Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special NABT event where we will be talking with Sean Carroll tonight on, as he talks about his release of his new book, A Series of Fortune Events. Um, this is also Jackie's first webinar for NABT. So you all are all going to be guinea pigs as we conduct this event. Um, we are going to be using a different format tonight. It's called a pre-recorded live model. And what that means is that Sean has recorded his presentation so that you can view it. Um, it helps with technology so there's no interruptions on his end so everybody can see the video and then he will be joining us for a live q a after i promise he's here i've already talked to him um so he will be here and he will be answering your questions from the chat so even while the video is playing feel free to ask questions via the chat i'm going to do a brief introduction of sean um we all know him as an award-winning scientist, author, educator, and film producer who leads the Department of Science Education at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. He's also an endowed chair of biology at the University of Maryland. He's a prolific author and has written numerous books, and he's also an, an Emmy-winning uh, film producer. More importantly, though, he is a prominent prominent science communicator who we have learned from for decades at this point. And Sean is always on the cutting edge of some of the most interesting things in science, science education, evolutionary biology. So we are so thrilled to have him with us here tonight. We're so excited to be able to highlight his newest book. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and start the presentation. Welcome to our event. Hi, I'm author and biologist Sean Carroll. Thanks for tuning in. But nothing puts those beliefs to the test like trauma or a close call. In 2001, Seth MacFarlane was the 27-year-old creator and executive producer of the not-yet-hit Family Guy. Having made a splash at such a young age, he was asked to speak at his alma mater in Rhode Island. And he tells the rest of the story to Piers Morgan. A combination of two things. I was, uh, I was giving a lecture at my college the night before and went out with some of the faculty afterwards and had had a, a few pints and uh so you got drunk yes and uh and a, a coupled with the fact that my my travel agent had listed the uh the, the flight on my itinerary was leaving 10 minutes later than it did and and i was you know i was i was generally late for flights you know i'd missed a lot of flights prior to that so it wasn't it wasn't like it was anything crazily out of the ordinary but i i got to the uh uh counter and and i said yeah i'm booked on flight 11 and and uh, the woman behind the counter said, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, you're, you're too late. They just closed the gate. And I said, all right, well, you know, I'll take the 11 o'clock. Went into the lounge, uh, fell asleep, woke up about 45 minutes later to a, to a commotion. And the first plane had hit and sat there and watched the second plane hit. And they announced what flight it was. And I turned to the guy next to me and and, uh, and said, my, my God, that, that was the flight I was supposed to be on. I, I was late. I missed it. McFarland was not the only celebrity to miss flight. 11. Mark Wahlberg was also scheduled to be on the flight, but changed his plans. And 11 years later, McFarlane and Wahlberg teamed up to make the movie Ted. Now, what are the odds these two guys would both miss American Flight 11 and later make a hit movie? Were their escapes from mass murder just dumb luck? 
or were their lives spared so that our lives would be enriched by a trash talking teddy bear? Globe Ultra Tuscan Orange Grapefruit. My God, America is imploding. Dumb luck, accident, chance, call it what you will. McFarland's late arrival to the airport was purely an accident, albeit an accident with profound personal consequences. What a difference just 30 minutes can make. It's sobering to think what a thin line there is between life and death. And what governs that thin line is a major focus of my new book. Because over the past 50 years, as scientists have learned so much more about the history and workings of the planet, we've been startled to discover how the course of life has been buffeted by a variety of cosmological and geological accidents, without which we would not be here. And as we've probed human biology and the factors that impact our individual lives, we've caught chance red-handed, reigning over that line between life and death. So today I'm going to highlight a few of those events that reveal just how much we live in a chance-driven world, and then briefly explore what that means for how we think about ourselves. So speaking of thin lines, that's exactly what puzzled the geologist working outside the beautiful town of Gubbio, Italy in the 1970s. Geologist Walter Alvarez saw an interesting pattern in a column of rock just outside of town. He noticed that in this large stack of limestone layers, there was a switch in color from white at the bottom to red above. And when Alvarez looked clo closer, he saw that there was a peculiar layer of grayish clay shown here where the coin is on the right that separated the two colors of, of limestone. Alvarez's decryption of that one centimeter thin line began to reveal the story of the most important day on Earth in the last 100 million years. A day that was very, very unlucky for most everything alive, but would eventually turn out to be extremely fortunate for us. And on that day, a long, long time ago, 30 minutes would make all the difference. The Gubbio rock formation was once part of an ancient seabed, so it contained the fossilized shells of tiny creatures called foraminifera, or forams for short, shown here in the electron microscope. These abundant single-celled creatures are part of the ocean's plankton community and food web. And when forams die, their shells settle in ocean sediments and form parts of limestones, which can be later pushed up by tectonic forces as they are in Italy. When Alvarez looked at the forams from the rock cut outside Gubbio, he saw that the white layer of rocks on the bottom contained a diverse array of large fossil forams. But the reddish layer of rock above lack those species and contained only a few smaller species of forams. And that thin layer of clay in between appeared to lack fossils altogether. Alvarez realized something dramatic had happened in the ocean that had driven many foram species extinct in a short period of time. Now that boundary represented by the clay line, that's also known from terrestrial deposits, like this one from the Western United States. The pocket knife is pointing to that boundary, which marks a dividing line between two worlds 66 million years ago. Below the boundary lay the rocks of the Cretaceous period, which make up the last third of the age of reptiles when dinosaurs ruled the land. Above the boundary lay the Paleogene, which contains no dinosaurs, but marks the beginning of the age of mammals, in which furry animals emerged to become the largest animals on land and in the seas. Alvarez and his colleagues wondered what on earth could have caused the disappearance of widespread tiny organisms like forams, as well as much larger creatures like dinosaurs. As you most likely heard, it was traces of the element iridium in that thin layer of clay that tipped them off that it wasn't something on earth, but something from space. An asteroid six miles wide and traveling approximately 50,000 miles per hour slammed into the Yucatan Peninsula. The enormous mass of rock blasted out of the crater was hurled in all directions. A thick curtain of ejecta traveled at 
several thousand miles per hour and rained down across North America, while the impact plume consisting of superheated air, carbon dioxide, water and sulfur vapor, vaporized rock, chunks of target rock, that shot ejecta at velocities greater than the Earth's escape velocity, more than 25,000 miles per hour, into and beyond the atmosphere, which then fell back down across the globe as trillions of red hot meteors. The result was hell on Earth. The falling ejecta heated the air to four to 600 degrees Fahrenheit, like a baking oven, and triggered global wildfires. The impact plume and soot from the wildfires blocked out the sun. Global temperatures then dropped by at least 20 degrees Fahrenheit, probably more. Food chains collapsed. And this blackout lasted for at least 10, perhaps as many as 30 years. During that time and afterwards, three quarters of all plant and animal species on Earth, including the great dinosaurs, went extinct. But this asteroid impact is the mother of all accidents. And that's because we've come to appreciate that there were pretty special circumstances for this mass extinction to happen. The destructive power of the plume depends upon the mineral content of the impact site. And geologists have figured that only 1 to 13% of the Earth's surface contains the right kinds of rocks to trigger a mass extinction if vaporized. So what that means is with the Earth rotating at 1,000 miles per hour, had this asteroid, which had been circling the solar system for perhaps 4 billion years, had it entered the Earth's atmosphere just 30 minutes earlier, it would have landed in the Atlantic. 30 minutes later, it would have landed in the Pacific. And in either case, there would be no mass extinction. The dinosaurs would still be here, and we would not. And of course, there would be no Ted, and God forbid, no Ted too. Now let me show you another collision. This one's a little more personal. In this clip, the collision at the upper right also triggers a shower of chemicals. But this time, life does not end. It begins. Because this is the moment of fertilization. The trembling and shower are part of the sequence of dramatic physical and chemical changes that occur in the egg that prevent fertilization by other sperm and begin the process of embryonic development. Out of a swarm of 100 million or more contenders, only a single lucky sperm will swim all the way up the fallopian tube and successfully fertilize the egg. The fertilized egg is the union of two genomes, half of its chromosomes from the sperm and half from the unfertilized egg. Now here's an astounding fact. No two fertilized human eggs will ever be the same. That's right, ever be the same. To see why, let's try a pop quiz. You ready? So by each contributing 23 chromosomes, how many genetically unique children do you think your parents could have? 23? 46, uh, 92, now try again. How about 70 trillion? That's right, 70 trillion. And what that means is that each of us, each one of us is a one in 70 trillion event, which means that fertilization, well, it's the accident of all mothers. To see why, let's break down the math. The number of possible chromosome combinations from dad can easily be calculated because you can give two different versions of each chromosome and there are 23 chromosomes. And so there are two to the 23rd power or 8,388,608 possible chromosome combinations from dad. Same math for mom, 23 chromosomes, two alternatives for each chromosome, 8 million plus possibilities. But the number of possible combinations of sperm and egg the number of possible combinations would each create a different child is the product of those two numbers, which gives you 70 trillion, 368 billion, 
744,177,664 unique children. After my arrival at 10 pounds, five ounces, my mom stopped at four. But this enormous number is actually an underestimate because of another important contributor, mistakes. I'm talking about the copying of DNA, three billion letters in each sperm, three billion letters in each egg. Heck, it's so easy to make mistakes with much shorter lines of text. Let me show you a couple of my favorite examples. So I'm a passionate baseball fan, started when I was a kid. And in the early days, I read the sports pages every day. And when I saw this story in 1974, I clipped it out and kept it forever. There are three mistakes in this very short sports article. See if you can spot them all. All right, you ready? There's the first one. There's the second one. And yep, there's the third one. That must have been quite a wallow. I don't think these were intentional. These are random mistakes, typos. Here's another howler from a slightly higher authority than the Toledo Times. This is the 1631 version of the King James Bible. And I'm drawing your attention to the seventh commandment. I'm pretty sure this is the copy of the Bible that's in the White House bedroom. The blasphemy was not detected for a year. And King Charles I was, well, he was royally pissed. He ordered that all copies be burned. He revoked the printer's license, one of whom died in debtor's prison. What a difference a single letter or word can make. The same is absolutely true in life's alphabet. Let me show you what a difference one typo can make. I'm going to show you a piece of very short piece of genetic text. The original line reads this, the single letter code. And just one typo, changing that middle M to R, has killed more than 33 million people. Now, how could such a small change be so deadly? I'll tell you that in a few minutes. The crux of the matter is the cause of that change. And that leads us to the DNA molecule. Now, this is the structure on the left that was worked out first by Watson and Crick in 1953. And the key breakthrough was the discovery of the rules for the pairing of the bases that hold the double helix together. G with C, A with T. They're located on the opposite strands of the double helix. Now, a footnote to that discovery is actually of central importance to my discussion today. So fair warning, I'm going to talk a little chemistry because the details are so revelatory. Don't worry, you're going to get the gist of it. It turns out that the bases occur in two alternative chemical forms. They differ by the position of one hydrogen. Okay, so in the top form, you can see that the oxygen up there in red does not have a hydrogen bound to it, but in the bottom form it does. Similarly, you'll see a hydrogen up above on that nitrogen that's lacking down here. And this is called the keto form and the enol form of these bases. At first, Watson only knew about this less common form, the enol form, and that stumped him. But he learned from a colleague that the keto form is actually the more common form, and history was made. The important detail, however, is that these two different forms, they bond with different bases. Now, only very recently has it been possible to capture and measure the transition between the two forms in DNA. And that reveals something very important. The enol form is fleeting. It's flickering back and forth, enol, keto, enol, keto. But the enol form lasts only about one one thousandth of a second before flipping back to the keto form. You might say, well, so what? Well, the so what is, if that happens where the DNA is being copied and the copying machinery is passing by, moving at about 1,000 bases per second, if it just happens by chance to pass when the enol form is present, well, the wrong base gets inserted. And that creates a mutation. So that flickering is random. 
And it's just a matter of chance of whether that DNA is being copied at that moment. So this is the process of random mutation. It's fundamentally what's happening. What does that tell us? It tells us the event at the root of mutation is an inescapable fundamental matter of physics. This quantum transition between chemical states, a little chance shape shift at the atomic level. And that tells us that mutation is a feature, not a bug in DNA. In every organism, in every cell, whenever DNA is copied, changes will occur because of the intrinsic characteristics of the very bases that endow DNA with its properties. Change, evolution, is unavoidable, inevitable. Now, of course, because every species DNA is different because of this process, every individual DNA is different, it's changed in this way. This tells us that chance is the source of all innovation, all beauty, all diversity in the living world. It's pretty hard to imagine, isn't it? How can chance generate everything we see in the living world? Well, that's a long story, but let me just show you one example, one example of how chance invents. And speaking of beauty, get a load of this guy. Okay, the, the most important thing about the Antarctic eel pout is not how it looks, but where it lives. It lives in waters that are very cold, about minus 1.8 degrees Celsius, below the freezing point of fresh water, lives in the Antarctic Ocean. And the main enemy of fish in these waters is not so much the cold, but ice. The water contains small ice crystals that if they get into the fish through its gills or, being, or get swallowed, that will nucleate the formation of larger ice crystals and bam, they're fish sticks. It would freeze the animals were it not for a key invention. And that invention is antifreeze. Eel pout blood does not freeze until it reaches about minus 2.1 degrees Celsius, colder than the ocean. The reason being that it's chock full of proteins that work as antifreezes. The antifreeze binds to small ice crystals and prevents them from growing larger. And it lowers the temperature at which those ice crystals can then grow. Now, the really neat part of this story is that we can track the origin of the genetic code for antifreeze, how it evolved from an entirely different gene, which gives us a forensic trail of how this invention arose, and it shows how chance mutation is an inventor. Now, a key clue came when it was noticed that the antifreeze protein bore an uncanny resemblance to a section of another protein found in other fish, in fact, in all sorts of other animals. The protein is an enzyme called SAS that's involved in the making of a specific sugar. We're not going to get into that, those details. The antifreeze sequence is very similar to a short sequence at the end of SAS, over there at the tail end. Now, the reason for the strong resemblance was deciphered by some expert sleuthing through the DNA of eel pouts and other fish. And that detective work revealed that the antifreeze gene evolved from a chunk of the SAS gene, a mutation deleted really sort of the core of the SAS gene, leaving behind the part that had some ice binding activity. That remaining chunk encoded a protein that on its own could bind to ice crystals. And that was the genesis of the first antifreeze gene. The eel pout's ancestors then ran, or rather swam with this invention and made many copies of the antifreeze gene expanding it to more than 30 copies, which enables the fish to make a lot of antifreeze. So if you look along the genome, along the chromosome of the eel pout, you see these other genes just like other fish have, and then this, boom, this battery of antifreeze genes. It's a telltale sign that this is a peculiar adaptation to where it lives. The eel pout has over 30 copies of this gene, all tandemly arrayed, and that tandem arrangement tells us there was another mutational mechanism at work that we know quite well, that duplicates individual or blocks of genes. Now, I could show many more examples of the creativity of mutations. I'll spare you and let this one make the point that mutation, thus chance, is the inventor. And what this means is, 
look around the world, is that we live in a world of mistakes governed by chance. Genetic accidents occur at random. They change genes without regard to the potential consequences. Now, the eventual fate of those mutations, well, that depends on external circumstances in a sieving process we call natural selection. Fair to ask then, what determines those external circumstances? So let's look at the eel pout example. The most relevant thing about the eel pout is the coldness of the Antarctic Ocean. So we ask, how and why did the Antarctic Ocean become so cold? The answer involves tectonics. You may know that the Earth's oceans and continents are on tectonic plates that move around the globe very slowly and have moved over time. And with respect to the Antarctic, a couple plates are most relevant to becoming cold. And that involves the former joining of the South American and Antarctic continents that existed, who were joined at least 65 million years ago, and the position of the Indian subcontinent, which 65 million years ago was below the equator, whereas today it's now up in Asia. It was that collision of the Indian subcontinent that triggered global cooling and glaciation of the Antarctic. And the separation of Antarctic from South America isolated the Southern Ocean and led to cooler currents circulating the continent. Okay, so I'm talking about tectonics, but then you might ask, and why did these plates move in the way they did? Well, the movement of these plates has to do with their size, their shape, and their speed is determined very much by their thickness. So why did these plates move the way they did? Well, they were parts of a supercontinent, Gondwana land, 140 million years ago that broke up. And from what we can tell, it broke up much like a kitchen plate breaks when it hits the floor. It broke into random pieces. Some of those pieces were larger, some were smaller. Smaller pieces like the Indian subcontinent moved more quickly and slammed into other continents. So what's that tell us? The size, shape, and speed of these plates is a matter of chance. So what does that tell us is that chance invents this internal mechanism based on DNA is the inventor. And the fate of that invention depends upon external circumstances shaped by chance. We're a long, long way from Providence, and I don't mean the capital of Rhode Island. It is astonishing that blind chance is the source of all novelty, diversity, and beauty in the living world. I hope that you are awestruck at what an asteroid, sliding tectonic plates, and a flickering polymer of just four bases have wrought. But our chance-driven existence also poses the unsettling quandary that we don't live in the best of all possible worlds, just our world. And this view, of course, shatters traditional beliefs about cause and effect in our world. Those beliefs are represented, for example, by this book and quote from theologian R.C. Sproul, who categorically rejects the existence of chance in his book, Not a Chance, the myth of chance in modern science and cosmology. Sproul says, it's not necessary for chance to rule in order to supplant God. Indeed, chance requires little authority at all if it is to depose God. All it needs to do the job is to exist. The mere existence of chance is enough to rip God from his cosmic throne. Chance does not need to rule, does not need to be sovereign. If it exists as a mere impotent, humble servant, it leaves God not only out of date, but out of a job. All right, so according to Sproul, chance puts God out of a job, or at least many of the jobs we've traditionally assigned to him or her. God is not in the conception business choosing the winning sperm and egg, nor the genetic engineering business designing creatures' DNA and traits, nor the weather-making business, nor the cancer business, nor, as it turns out, the pandemic business. Remember that piece of code I showed you before about how much difference one typo can make? Well, now I'll reveal to you that the original text 
those nine letters I'm showing you, is a small part of a virus called the simian immunodeficiency virus that infects, for example, chimpanzees. And that the altered text with that one typo is the corresponding part of the human immunodeficiency virus, the HIV virus. And what we know about that change is that that mutation leading from M to R enables chimpanzee virus to infect humans. And that has occurred by accident at least three separate times and triggered the AIDS pandemic. What a difference one typo can make. So if not theologians, you know, who do we turn to to think about chance and its implications? So I choose novelist Kurt Vonnegut. Now Vonnegut wrote a lot about our accident-driven world and our struggle for meaning in many of his works. And I want to share with you one particular story that comes from his semi-autobiographical novel, Slapstick. He explains that his sister Alice was dying of cancer at the age of 41, and he and his brother went to visit her on what turned out to be the last day of her life. And he wrote, hers would have been an unremarkable death statistically if it were not for one detail, which is this. Her healthy husband, James Carmel Adams, the editor of a trade journal for purchasing agents, which he put together in a cubicle on Wall Street, had died two mornings before on the broker special the only train in American railroading history to hurl itself off an open drawbridge. Think of that. This really happened. Now, the great humorist concocted many fantastic scenarios in his books, but this really did happen, just as he said. The train plunged off an open drawbridge, killing 48 people, including Vonnegut's brother-in-law. Now, he and his brother decided they would keep this information from their sister, Alice, because she was, of course, concerned about the future for her children. They had four children together. But another patient told Alice about the accident. She read the newspaper and saw her husband among the list of victims. And her response to that, Vonnegut writes, since Alice had never received any religious instruction, and since she had led a blameless life, she never thought of her awful luck as being anything but accidents in a very busy place. Good for her. Accidents in a very busy place indeed. We now know that we are all here, both collectively and individually, through a series of accidents, cosmological, geological, and biological accidents. Vonnegut's books helped me to realize that next to scientists, the one group of people that seem least inclined to think everything happens for a reason, rather that blind chance governs the world, are humorists and comedians. So many great present day comedians, Seth MacFarlane, Eric Idle, Bill Maher, Ricky Gervais, Sarah Silverman, and many more. And late greats from Mark Twain to Vonnegut to George Carlin have rejected traditional beliefs about cause in the world. So many very funny people, in fact, that it made me wonder, why is this so? What do scientists and comedians have in common? Why are comedians drawn towards such subjects? I reached out to several, some of whom kindly took the time to reply. And I'll leave that conversation for those who want to read the book. But I'm going to close today with a couple of gems from two comedians. The first comes from Ricky Gervais, who told 60 Minutes the following. It always comes back to us. Why are we here? Well, we just happen to be here. We couldn't choose it. We're not special. We're just lucky. And this is a holiday. We didn't exist for 14 and a half billion years. Then we got 80 or 90 years if we're lucky. And then we'll never exist again. So we should make the most of it. Now, of course, when bad things happen, we all struggle. How can we cope? I think Eric Idle has the best answer. When you do find yourself in in a kind of a, a, you know a dark place like that, something going wrong. I mean, how do you deal with with difficult stuff like that, Eric? Well, you know, philosophy is really helps. I mean, you know, some some things in life are bad. Uh, they can really make you mad. <laughs> Other things just make you swear and curse. When you 
chewing on life's gristle. Stand down. Give a whistle. And this will help things turn out for the best. And always look on the bright side of life. Always look on the right side of life. Life is jolly rotten, the shouting you forgot. And that's the laugh and smile and dance and sing. When you're feeling in the dumps, don't be silly chaps. Just close your lips and wish all that's the thing. Always look on the right side of life. Always look on the right side of life. For life is quite absurd, and death's the final word. You must always face the curtain with a bow. Forget about your shit. Give the audience a grin. Enjoy it, it's your last job to the hour. Always look on the bright side of death. Hey, Jackie, I just need a uh, video on. If you can hear me. Jackie, I need my video on. Isn't that a setting on yours? No, it says you can't start your video because the host has stopped it. Okay, I will definitely get it on. <laughs> go ahead and answer some questions. <laughs> sure, you guys can hear me, hopefully. Let's see, here we go. Oh, there it is. Ah, are we finally here? All right. Hey, everybody. Friday night, thanks for joining. If you're home, and I know what kind of week you've had, join me. Um, I know that uh, the there was things were out of sync and uh, the, the top of the show was was a little uh, you missed a little bit but I just the setup there was you know, I wrote this book really to deal with this question that's been going on for the ages which is you know to what degree does everything happen for a reason and and how much happens for chance and you know philosophers have wrestled with this for thousands of years but especially in the last 50 years or so scientists have discovered startling phenomena uh, that we didn't imagine before that sort of underscore to all of us, um, just how much we live on a, on a chance-driven planet. So um, I wrote this relatively short book uh, to bring some of those findings to life, everything from asteroid impact, which is probably fairly familiar, familiar to you, um, perhaps not so much the tectonics of how the Earth cooled down and entered the ice ages, um, you know, right down to the quantum flipping and in, in DNA bases that underlies mutation. 
So uh, I hope you uh, made it through those 35 minutes. <laughs> Appreciate you hanging on. Um, and I have the Q&A in front of me, Jackie, and I'm looking if uh, happy to answer any questions. If you hit Q&A, hopefully that's live. How did we get feathers? You mean on birds? Says a six, as, as a six-year-old. Well, they didn't start out, I think maybe this is one of the really important uh, general ideas about how invention happens, is that a lot of things that have a certain function that we know now, like feathers on birds, uh, didn't start off for flight. They were probably either involved in display or um, keeping bodies warm in cold-blooded animals um, like reptiles. So uh, great question, but everything you think about, whether it's, you know, these things didn't start out as hands, they started out as fins. 400 million years ago or so. Um, our lungs um, were swim bladders. Uh, lots of things in, in, uh, in terms of invention are repurposed parts of anatomy from before. I'll keep answering questions as they pop up. How technical is the book? Could a non-scientist read and understand? Oh, I hope so. I certainly wrote it for that. In fact, if, if you get any vibe from the talk, this is probably my most I mean, it's a serious subject, but I'd say it's my most lighthearted attempt at dealing with a serious subject. So the book is full of anecdotes. In fact, it does tell the Seth MacFarlane story because I was trying to pair up um, sort of these stories that bring home to us in a very personal way. Uh, you know, there's nothing like close calls and sort of what ifs, right? We can all think of what ifs in our own life. And if I put sort of profound what ifs there at individual lives like Seth MacFarlane, um, you can think about all the what ifs in our own lives. And um, so there's a lot of anecdotes like that. I won't give them all away because I did choose them to be, dare I say, entertaining. Um, and there's a conversation at the end of the book that I'll, I'll tease again, which is, um, it's a conversation among Eric Idle and Albert Camus and Kurt Vonnegut and Sarah Silverman, and a bunch of others that I created to sort of talk about um, what with these ideas about chance, what, what they might make us think. So it's absolutely, it's written for, it's a trade book written for general audiences. And uh, my job was to make it uh, not only, um, you know, comprehensible, but even, even entertaining. Somebody just finished reading this book. Did you ever consider writing uh, chapters on the role of chance in making the earth a habitable planet or creating the last universal common ancestral cell? Great questions. Um, I think, I, I decided to really almost kind of focus on the last 66 million years because I felt that those were most proximate to us. Um, there's lots of, you know, what, how the earth was formed and how the atmosphere became oxygenated and things like this. There's lots of things that were necessary to have happen, all sorts of contingencies, you know, 4 billion years of contingencies for us to get here. But I really wanted to focus on these things that are tangible. I mean, you can go out in hundreds of places around the world and put your finger right on the boundary, the fallout layer from the asteroid, that extinction boundary. I've done it in five or six places, chills down my spine when I realize what that signifies for the change in the world, the world of dinosaurs below and the world of mammals above. So I, I just focused on things for which we had the greatest amount of sort of powerful empirical evidence um, from there, but certainly, um, uh, you know, physicists would talk, would go all the way back to, of course, the birth of the universe or multiverses and universal laws, et cetera. But I, I want to just focus and, 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 and leave room in the book, especially to talk about our individual lives, sorting of chromosomes, gaining mutations. Uh, I even dared write a chapter on cancer, which is called a series of unfortunate events, because um, we sometimes have to look at the other side of, of chance. So thank you for that. Um, I'm moving through the questions. I'm just taking them. Look, I also know I'm with teachers. There's no place I'd rather be on a Friday night. Uh, on behalf of myself, the department, Howard Hughes, you guys are our heroes. Um, nobody could imagine the circumstances under which you're trying to teach right now. So anything we can do to support that, encourage you. Um, I'd say this buds for you, but it's a Stella tonight. That's all I can say. Um, somebody says, thank you for the books. Uh, specifically Serengeti rules and endless forms. Thank you very much. Thank you for reading them. Hope you enjoy this one. Um, how do my ideas about rampant chance reconcile with free will? I think this is the beautiful thing. So much chance has generated so much biologically, but of course, as, as humans, you know, we do exert control over 
we have choice in what we do. And so um, it's interesting that the last you know, several million years of evolution, we wound up with this two-legged primate with a really big brain. And by the way, I do tell the story of a really big brain and its connection to the ice ages and how the ice ages got rolling. Um, but yeah, the, the fortunate thing is we, we have free will, a lot of free will. We don't necessarily control all these invisible events in our bodies, but we, we do exercise free will. So I think it's a philosophically rich area. And I think philosophers need to get onto this. Um, they need to kind of look at ideas they've wrestled with for centuries and really understand um, the role of chance um, on the planet and in individual lives. So better to be philosophers. Next question, I got to give a shout out. This is, I assume this is Jamie Jensen from BYU, one of my heroes. Um, how would you answer a student's question about how much chance is still playing a role in the human population today? Well, I would think about every baby that's born is a one in 70 trillion uh, different chrom chromosome combinations. Um, I would also, uh, someone also picked up recombination. It's in the book, but I don't, I haven't put it in the, I didn't put it in the talk because um, again, that's a little bit sophisticated for some audiences. Um, of course, random mutation, but in, in terms of a role in, in human population, we're not together in person because of a chance event. Some randomly mutating animal virus in China hopped into a human and changed the world for all of us for the last year. So maybe I'd almost start there and say, um, look at how the whole human population has been impacted by a chance biological event, you know, far away. So I think uh, there's lots of examples where you can, you can personalize it or you can globalize it now. I, I say that, I know I'm looking at my face and I'm thinking he's grinning. I'm not grinning about the pandemic. This is the worst thing anyone could imagine, but it is, it is on point. The quantum flicking of DNA, can you elaborate? This is the first time I've heard about it. Okay, so tautomers, and you can look up tautomers in general, but um, you know, when we, when we draw a chemical structure, you know, we draw it fixed because we don't, we don't have a way of showing sort of the, the um, oscillations in, in, in chemical structures, but the position of that hydrogen is not fixed. It just has to do with um, the nearest neighbors, the atoms that are its nearest neighbors. And so it, it bounces around in that ring. And a lot of tautomer, tautomers are, ring, are these ring structures. The amazing thing about that story, and I saw some commentary at the bottom when I talked about the double helix story, is that the, the key contribution Watson made to the model, and I understand that understanding the helical structure of DNA, crucial, Rosalind Franklin's pictures, x-ray pictures of DNA were crucial. But Watson, credit to Watson goes for figuring out the base pairing rules, which he was, uh, well, he was stumped because in fact, he first started with models that were the enol form. And he couldn't solve it until somebody in the lab said, hey, uh, he, he copied them out of a textbook, but this was a 1950, whatever, organic chemistry textbook, and they had them wrong. And only when he used the keto form did he solve, oh, wait, I've got base pairing and these bases can stack. But then they realized, and they wrote it in the first paper, that that enol form could be the basis of mutation. And 60 years later, we can say that it is. So this is a really, you know, um, powerful insight that comes from structure and from chemistry that um, that enol form is going to, is going to uh, flick on and off, lasting only about one one-thousandth of the second. But this machinery, the copying machinery at the atomic level is moving very quickly. And occasionally there's a misincorporation because of the enol form. And that's the basis of point mutation. I'll keep going. You guys, you guys are, are, are great. Oh my God, great number of questions. Are there any known disadvantages to the eel pout in terms of this protein-laden plasma? Well, I think to live in that cold environment, there's probably lots of trade-offs. Um, you oxygen is abundant, but energy expenditure is probably pretty uh, pretty expensive, physiologically expensive. So I don't think these are very fast-moving animals. These are fairly sedentary animals. Um, but I don't think this protein per se is any particular um, disadvantage, none that I can think of, maybe in terms of viscosity of plasma or something like that. But that viscosity might itself help contribute to, to lowering a freezing point. But it's, it's a great question, it may simply not been something anybody's um, contemplated before. 
Have you always had these ideas, Judy asks, or there's a particular event that sent you on this path of thinking about chance? Yeah, let me let me credit. I, I wrote a there's an article in the Atlantic on my byline from last week about a biologist you probably all know named Jacques Manot. Um, Manot and Francois Jacob were the discoverers of the operon. Um, so if you know the Lac operon, this is their pioneering work. And Manot is an incredibly fascinating person who I got to spend several years researching and writing about in an earlier book. I got to meet, I know his family, I got to meet people he worked with, including the people he worked with in the French resistance, a, a remarkable person. And he, after he won the Nobel Prize in biology, he wrote a book in 1970, in fact, in October, 1970, 50 years ago to this month, called Chance and Necessity. And so he explored this question of chance and what its meaning was, because he felt that molecular biology was making these discoveries that weren't registering in sort of the public mindset. And um, he wanted to bring that to the public's attention. And uh, the book, it's, it's a little dry, you might say. And it was his first and only book. And he was, you know, didn't know what reaction it would bring. And uh, it became a number two bestseller in France. Number two, at the time, only to the French translation of Love Story, because th this is France. But anyway, uh, Manot is an interesting character. There's a feature article I wrote, him, wrote, him, uh, wrote about him in the Atlantic from uh, last week. So if you just search my byline in the Atlantic, I think that's an article out in front of the paywall and you'll know one of my inspirations. Manot is, is one of the most remarkable people I've ever looked into, let alone um, biologists. Uh, so a big influence on me. Thank you for that question. It allowed me to talk a little bit about, about Manot. Um, may we use portions of this book with students this year that will involve scanning it and providing it as a PDF? It says an anonymous attendee. <laughs> um, you have to just check the rules about what you can use. Um, I can't grant that to you. The publisher has to worry about that. Um, I will talk to the publisher about materials for teaching with this. The book is very early. You may know, uh, like the Serengeti rules, um, uh, Princeton uh, did put out an instructor's guide. Paul Strode um, crafted that instructor's guide to the teacher's guide to that book. Um, this is so early. You know, part of it is, is for you all to let me and, and my publisher know whether, you know, you find this book useful, whether this is a book either in total or in portions that you'd like students to read. It's the shortest book I've written at, I think, 180 pages of the main text. Uh, it has the most jokes. Um, and uh, but I think, you know, I'm hoping it, it packs a while, but look, it's too early for me to say, you, you guys are the best judge of whether this is worthwhile. Am I gonna make a short, next question. Um, am I gonna make a short film based on chance that I could connect to the ice fish film? Well, again, kind of, it depends a bit on feedback here. You know, I'm, I'm smitten with this topic, uh, I'm game, but um, I need to know what you folks think. And, and, and really, you know, you, could, you guys can reach me um, at my HHMI email, you can reach me through my author page. There's a, there's a comment section. But, you know, for the last 20 years, I've been influenced a great deal in, in, in feedback um, from teachers as to what, um, what you're interested in and, and what sort of things to unpack. But, you know, as, uh, you know overall, uh, I really think that this idea of chance is one of the most, one of the biggest ideas science has presented to us. Um, but it's sort of underappreciated. Underappreciated as a fact of life, underappreciated as a fact uh, of the planet. And I think uh, if, you, if you think students will engage with it, that's great. Can you think of a way, Leslie Shapiro asks, can you think of a way to model random chance with younger audiences? My daughter just finished your book and has been asking ways for model this at home. Well, this is the fun part. I think I'll, give, I'll throw one out there, which is I, I actually start the book talking particularly about I talk about holes in one, I talk about casinos, um, you know, roulette, um, all that. Um, obviously, there are games of pure chance, dice, roulette, et cetera. And, you know, those, you know, dice determine the number of possible outcomes, roulette determines the number of possible outcomes. And the thing to get an idea is, is that when you have multiple events, then obviously you start compounding the odds of a particular set of events. So I think I would do it with games of chance. Um, cards, you know, playing cards, um, roulette, or just take her to a casino. I think that's a, 
It's a great place to learn lots of things about life. How did they measure and track the keto enol switching? Um, very sophisticated biophysics that is beyond my ability to describe. Um, the pioneering work was done by Hashim Al Hashimi at um, Duke University, biochemist, uh, phenomenal, phenomenal biochemist, uh, recently recognized with major award from the National Academy of Sciences. So, um, in the primary literature, you know this this is the cutting edge of biophysics, cutting edge of uh, the ability of um, of technology to detect these events, which is why it took so long. So uh, again, a fantastic accomplishment um, to pin this down. Thank you, Madeline. Uh, Robert Dennison said, were you influenced by Stephen Gould's Rewind the Tape and get something entirely different analogy? Certainly I read that, um, Robert, in um, Wonderful Life, uh, spurred always spurred a lot of discussion among biologists and others of if we, if you're not familiar with the argument, the idea is um, if we rewound the tape of life and ran it all over again, would we get the same outcome? And, you know, one thing I would say, you know, if the asteroid doesn't hit, you know, heck no. So um, I guess you say if you rewound the tape, when you have contingency piled upon contingency piled upon contingency, you know, would things exactly turn out the same way? So I didn't pick up that analogy in the book much because I was really trying to get to the power of specific events. Um, so I, I really didn't want sort of that global argument. I just sort of say, look, look how long the odds were. Look how many events had to happen in a particular way for us to be here, for you and I to have this conversation tonight. Um, just a nice comment from Tony. Thank you very much. I don't, if there's anything more to your question, um, that's great. Um, what about longer periods of stasis? What happens during longer, longer periods and how's the tipping point occur? Boy, Dwayne, that's a great question. I, I think in the, in the geological record, I think we generally, the general thought is, at least as it's been imparted to me, is that these periods of stasis we see are general environmental stability. And that as the earth changes, as that habitat recorded in that record in the rocks changes, then life has to change along with it. And so I think those longer periods re re reflect geological um, climatic stability and punctuated changes are these changes. Now, how does the tipping point occur? This is, this is a great question. I think the, the, the model to zip in on or the, the phenomenon to, to, to zero in on, again, stuff that I did not know as, at all until I investigated this book, did research for this book, was particularly the rapid, geologically speaking, rapid flipping of the climate over the last 100,000 years. When some of the first um, paleoclimatologists drilled ice cores in Greenland and used the gas, the, the uh, air, uh, gas trapped in, in the ice in Greenland to figure out what the climate was like, their minds were blown because they realized that the surface temperature of Greenland had been flipping back and forth every few thousand years by as much as 20 degrees Celsius. And that was totally unexpected. And yet that periodicity was not regular. So you have rapid flipping of high magnitude that's irregular. And there's thinking about those tipping points and it has to do everything from the Atlantic circulation to melt water off, the, off um, uh, Greenland, and it also inter interacts with the orbital cycles, which control overall the, the intervals of the Ice Age. So, but the tipping point is not clear, and you may have you know, multiple things happening together. So thanks, Dwayne, for that question. Terzing gives me, here comes the big one. I've got to get my catcher's mitt on for this one. In a chance-driven universe, is there a chance for the exist existence of God? And I think the way I'd like to address this is I think, you know, this is the rich question for all of us to think about, and there is no answer. Um, I, I quoted one theologian, R.C. Sproul, because he was so explicit about chance. Well, that's one theologian, and there's thousands of theologies. And I think in this, in, you know, in the last several hundred years, as various theologies have intersected with science, um, they've been reconciling um, their doctrine with whatever science um, uncovers. And some have made better accommodation of science and some have become more estranged from science. 
but um, I think there are, you know, I think that you'll get a lot of answers to that. You'll get a, a, a nice range of um, answers to that question. Is there a chance for the existence of God? You know, in the simplest, let's take two absolute extremes. One extreme is the picture of an intervening God that is to me what I was really referring to when you think about the God choosing, you know, the winning sperm at conception or, you know, a mutation in DNA. That personal intervening God, um, you know, I'm obviously throwing things out there that would seem to think that maybe that needs to be rethought, that we're not attributing the right phenomena. Um, I, I, you know, I think it's sort of like, don't blame God for pandemics and cancer and we don't necessarily need to credit God for butterflies, but take your, you know, take your choice from that. Um, at the other extreme is, is, uh, is the notion of, uh, you know, of a, a higher power that set everything in motion, the laws of the universe and this, everything that we witness is the unfolding from some initial events. And that's a, a view embraced by lots of theologians. In fact, some almost immediately upon Darwin's publication of the origin of species is to say, oh, it, it's not that, you know, God necessarily created humans, he, he created a world that generated humans, and, and evolution is, is God's mechanism. Um, not a thought I run into a lot on the street, but nonetheless, a, a pretty important branch of, of theology. But great question, Rich, Rich, uh, if you're all, if you're together with some friends tonight, throw that one out at the, at the cocktail party. Did you ever talk about the great Pangea? Because I missed that because I got kicked out of the meeting a few times due to slow internet. Sorry about, about the slow internet. Um, I talked about Gondwana land because about 140 million years ago as Gondwana land broke up in all sorts of pieces, um, one piece was smaller and thinner than the others. And that was the Indian subcontinent. And that which was in the Southern hemisphere near Madagascar moved north at a much higher rate than any other plates were moving in the last 60 million years, slammed into Asia, built the Himalaya, and all that rock building pulled um, CO2 out of the atmosphere and cooled the earth, leading to the glaciation of um, the Antarctic. So I talked about Gondwana land and tectonics. What do you do with the, Anne Mayo asks, what do you do with the counter thought that since these events are so improbable, they can't be chance. There are just too many to lead up to the current world. Oh, I think we need some Stella for that one. Mm. I think we try to find the most proximate explanations for things and see if you can build the chain. So they do add up. Thank you, Karen, skull to you. Um, they do add up, but the idea that they can't be chance, I guess that's just not where my brain goes. I'm, you know, I guess I sort of think like I'm a pool player, right? And, you know, I don't know where the balls are going to wind up after I break, but I do know they're going to go all over the table. So, um, which looks like kind of a chaotic situation. You think, well, how did all these balls get there? And I think, well, they just kind of ricochet off every, each other. So um, it's an interesting question. And I think these are great questions, folks. I think they're, you know, they're rich. I don't have, I don't have the answers to these things. And, and some of the fun is these questions are, are questions that we've been asking for a long time. Now the, you know, philosophers, you may have seen the slide at the top, the philosophers I was quoting, um, you know, the ancients uh, have been asking about, you know, chance and determinism for, for a couple thousand years. Um, we'll st we'll, I, if we could time travel, we'll be still talking about it, I think at least another thousand years from now. Um, which origin of life do you subscribe to or think is most likely? RNA first, protein first, et cetera. Well, my colleagues have probably you know built the picture. When the discovery that RNA um, could be catalytic uh, and all sorts of things that were built on that, I think has been very persuasive that um, you needed a self-replicating molecule that could mutate and yet sort of be the foundation for, for coding things, for things that eventually wind up think, being things like translation. So I'll, I'll go with RNA first, but I also really think people ask, talk about origin of life. This is, a, this is still a huge frontier for exploration. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's not the most solid chapter in the, in the books we write. 
Ah, Dr. Strode is, has, has rung in from, from Boulder. Anecdotes are salient and often overshadow data and statistics. What advice do you have for teachers with students who are convinced of miracles? Grandma was supposed to die of cancer, but didn't. Well, first, just be thankful if grandma makes it. Um, what advice do you have for teachers with students who are convinced of miracles? Gosh, I don't think I would ever try to debate that. You know, I, I just think um, you've presented them with, with some explanation, I, I, I would, I'd be very hesitant to, I mean, as much as, you know, I don't think it's a miracle, um, but I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just hesitant to go there, especially I think with students, I, I think um, you, you've given them a, a lot of grounding to think about the world as a cause and effect world. And just because it's chance doesn't mean there isn't a cause. I'm telling you that mutation has a chance basis, but it has a very mechanistic um, output. So um, question just popped at the bottom, what's a miracle? And I think we're looking at miracles as, as the supposition of some, some intervention of some supernatural uh, force. And um, uh, it's a great one. I think uh, Dr. Strode and I will be having some sidebars on this in the future. Um, but you'll, I call upon the other teachers for that, that collective wisdom. I, that, that's a that's a delicate area that I wouldn't go near. If, if somebody told me that they were convinced their grandmother survived because of a miracle, I, I would just say, well, isn't that wonderful? That would be my reaction. Um, is it only G that flickers between the enol uh, to keto form? Um, this is gonna be also adenine is gonna have a keto form. Um, so nicely done. That's, uh, I give the G example and I got to remember my keto chemistry, but I'm pretty sure that adenine does the same thing. You've got, um, yeah, you got it. it you, I might've flunked the test. So I might've gotten two points off on that one, but we'll, we'll, we'll check. Um, do you talk about the ecology of the early hominids? Do you give us any teas of those stories from Simon? Yeah. Um, Look, the last couple million years are the first ice age in the last 300 million. And paleoanthropologists, um, I think, have built a pretty strongly convincing narrative that um, our big brains, um, which evolved in, in Africa, that Africa, the story of the last two million years is not so much ice and, and the lack of it, but of um, wet and dry. And you go to places like... Um, uh, Orgasali in Kenya, this is where it's best documented. And you just see that the climate over the last several hundred thousand years has just been flipping back and forth from wet to dry, excuse me. And the sense is that, but then you see the evolution of tool use, particularly in that time. And you realize that, you know, we're the first animals that can really shape their habitat to the degree we do, even many, many, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years ago with fire with tools. And the thought is that this big brain is a, you know, it is, helps us navigate the instability of habitat over longer periods of time. Um, you know, we migrate around, we are going to get foods at different times of the year, but um, over the long term, the durability of the hominid lineage, our lineage, um, that, that um, rapid um, increase in brain size we think it's the environmental instability that, that was a driver of that. And yes, um, that is the main point of chapter two of the book. Thank you for that. Leslie Sandra Jones asks, what do you say to the astrophysics folks who seem to think they'll find life on another planet? I've always wondered what makes them think that life elsewhere would be similar to or anything like life here. Um, great question and there's a couple of questions nested in there. I will tell you the same thing. Astronomers, um, biologists and geologists, I know that have worked on missions like Mars missions, they all think that life is widespread in the universe, but they all think that life is, it, is probably a microbial grade. Um, meaning, you know, unicellular would be abundant. And look, if you visited Earth anytime in the first three and a half to four billion years, that's all you would have seen. So, you know, replicating molecules inside some kind of compartment, in our case, lipid bubbles, um, widespread, 
but you know, dinosaurs, butterflies, and hominids. Yeah. Um, so I don't think that we're thinking of life forms like those that have emerged on Earth. I think we're just thinking about replicating life. And a really interesting question is, what chemistry? And you know, we need it. It would be great someday to have an example of life from elsewhere and be able to analyze that chemically and see just how many solutions are are there to 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 the making of life. You know, we don't even know whether life on Earth might have come from somewhere else on an asteroid. So um, we don't know whether it was de novo evolved here. Um, so um, huge frontier and you know, talk about philosophically impactful things. I think when we have really convincing evidence of life elsewhere, um, that will be one huge milestone. And when we can sample it and analyze it, um, wow, I'd give some of Howard Hughes millions to have that shot. Um, why isn't evolution selected for a single best species or at least a single best producer, primary consumer, secondary consumer? Kimberly, that's a, God, that's a profound question. Um, I think part of it is there, there's just sort of, there's so many niches on earth and, and niches within niches. And as soon as life starts to diversify, you just have more and more niches. And so you have local adaptation just gives you greater, greater and greater diversity. And then you add to that isolation, you know, think things that are going on in one part of the world are different from another part of the world. So to be the single best producer under, you know, conditions, you know, in New England is really different than the to be the single best producer in conditions in Mexico or in Kenya or in Australia. So geographic variability selects for a wide variety of life and within it, the, the number of niches multiply. So I think that gives us um, the great rich diversity of life. A nice comment from Peggy, thank you about HHMI resources. I'll pass that on to the team. Um, I think particularly, as you know, the biointeractive team, and we always are uh, grateful to all of you for collaboration and making these resources, feedback uh, on those resources, and of course, for many of you um, who help us uh, get these resources um, to your fellow teachers and, and help workshop them. Um, how would you sell these concepts to undergraduates who may hail from a relatively conservative part of the country? Okay, that's a two sipper. Um, I think all of you, you know, have a lot of experience um, treading in waters where you know that some kids have been raised in ways that make this uncomfortable, if not um, worse for some students. So I think, you know, maybe. I think the asteroid story is pretty well accepted and geez, there's great physical evidence for it. So that's one end of the spectrum. And then at the other end, you know, 100 million sperm. So you got to ask where the other 99,999,000, et cetera, go. Um, so why that one? Um, it's demonstrable in the lab. You can show this independent segregation of chromosomes. You know, any kind of crossing experiment will give you a sense of that. So I think you just sort of build an, an empirical set and just kind of build it gradually. I think the building blocks are here's chance over here, here's chance over here, here's chance over here. You probably don't go so far as quoting theologians and I don't know if you did do the Monty Python song, but um, you get started from there and, and it's just start with empirically demonstrable phenomena. And you can just talk about how chance being a big factor um, in life. They won't necessarily go to some conclusions that I or you might, but they can still incorporate it into their worldview and, um, and realize that, that lots of things about this world are, are uh, chance-driven. Um, Donald Shaw asks about um, searching for life on other planets. I mean, if that's a question of am I in favor, I'm, I'm absolutely in favor. Um, if you haven't seen it, we made a, a Tangle Bank, the studio I lead at HHMI, made a movie called The Farthest a couple of years ago. Um, you should be able to stream that on PBS for free. It may also be available in Biointeractive. I hope I'm not making that up. Uh, great story of the Voyager missions and the whole search for life on other planets. And then there's a companion film to that um, called Second Genesis, really asking, that focuses on the search for life on other planets. So um, I've also hung out with uh, even 
just before the pandemic, I was hanging out with a bunch of um, astronomers and astrobiologists and, that, and, and uh, met a lot of very young scientists from JPL, incredible group of young people. And I had no idea the number of missions that are going on. And they're all gung-ho to go sample the moons of various planets and things and look for some signature of life. So this is a story that's going to keep, keep going because there's lots of um, missions underway and, and being planned to go sample um, places around the solar system. Jamie Jensen, again. Um, so I should have explained Jamie um, works on a project about um, reconciling evolution. Uh, evolution and faith has just done some absolutely amazing work, both uh, in, in the published scholarly realm, but also um, in uh, sharing those learnings from Brigham Young with lots and lots of other schools. Um, Jamie asked, do you think if life began on another habitable planet that two-legged humanoids would evolve again by chance? I, you know, it's a, it's a number, it, I'll, I'll do it. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go with the golf analogy I use in the book, Jamie, which is, um, you know, for a certain phenomenon to happen twice, you need, you need a certain number of swings. Now I'm, a, I'm an avid golfer, not a great golfer, but an avid golfer. And uh, only about five, I almost had a different story to tell tonight because like five weeks ago, I'm pretty sure the ball went in the hole and back out again, which would have been my first hole in one. So if you think of like two-legged hominids as a hole in one on this planet and you say, well, what's the chance it's going to happen again? You just need a lot of other planets would be my, would my thought. You need, you need to run this experiment many, 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 many times over, you know, billions of years. And um, sure, could happen. Um, I'm not sure if all the rest of the traits are going to be similar, but something that's up on two things that move um, might even have a big brain. But you, I would say you want a lot of planets for that to happen. Uh, Miss Lisa Ellis says, many people will find the significance of chance disturbing, yet you view it with awe. Is there a way to encourage movement from the prior to the latter? I guess um, it's too early to tell, Lisa. I, I do view it with awe. I, I, it's why also I kind of use the Ricky Gervais quote because Ricky's so positive and it's so life embracing to say, okay, we got here by chance. This is our 80 or 90 years. We make of it what we can. And I would also say, um, and this is in the tail end of the book, you might be surprised. So Ricky Gervais and Bill Maher and Eddie Azard, a couple, a few comedians that I quote and, and have a conversation with at the end of the book. They also, I, I quote them quite a bit talking about the golden rule, because I think people also may think if it's chance, you know, then what's our purpose? And if it's chance, how do we behave, et cetera? And, you know, with respect to the Bible, the Bible is full of wisdom of how we should treat each other. Um, wisdom that everyone could be reminded of right now. And, um, and and so I think there's a lot of consternation or a lot of anxiety that somehow a worldview that embraces chance somehow would, for example, leave morality behind. Not at all. Um, or, or leave some of that traditional wisdom behind. I would say not at all. So I think this is the really interesting thing about just engaging. And you know, if, if people shut down, then there's there's no room for growth. And if I if I approach this in a way that makes people shut down, then I I screwed up. So I think you you know that awe and wonder is there, and then you just you know you sort of navigate the the territory that people find uncomfortable, or they have to navigate that on on their own. So I, I think you start with awe and wonder, and and I do I start again with there's no accident that I the cover of the book has the asteroid impact and and sperm fertilizing eggs. I took two familiar phenomena and, um, you know, kind of connect them as the mother of all accidents and the accident of all mothers. And so these are familiar stories to people in a sense, but then when you get into the unlikeliness of an asteroid of that size and the unlikeliness of a mass extinction, and you get into the um, probabilities around fertilization, then I think it starts to seep in a bit. Um, Michael asks, in appreciation of the Friday evening beverage, what role does chance play in the adoption and use of mind altering substances in the development of the homo group or even other animals? Well, that's a great question to ask about other animals. I, I don't know, people might know, do, do animals consume some things just to get a little, you know, 
a little lightheaded to make the news headlines go by a little easier? Rapid answer, yes. So that being true, uh, then it's perhaps not surprising that that the HOMO group has explored this and that you know plants are full of these psychoactive substances, which I assume um, either play some role in, in, in deterrence or attraction of, of consumers. So um, great question, Michael, and I need to do more homework on, uh, so it's saying wolves eat overripe things. Seriously, other animals do. So look, you're all teaching each other in the chat box. I can't look at the Q&A in the chat box simultaneously, you know, fast enough back and forth. So I'm going to let you guys all explore that. Uh, Orla Berry asks, how do we generalize the importance of critical thinking given the US we live in? I shifted to environmental studies from AP Bio, and I'm working to get a different selection of students to be critical thinkers and discerning readers. Well, folks, this is why I think you guys hold the most important jobs in the country and for our future. Um, you know, biology is central to the future of humanity. It's been central since well, forever, but I, I, th I think back, for example, um, my wife and I got to visit the caves in Southern France a couple of years ago and see these drawings of animals on the, on the cave walls. And I think that, you know, these are answers. There's the great art, they're incredibly sharp with respect to proportions of anatomy and all that. And not too long after that, you get um, the domestication of crops and of livestock and things like this. And I think, you know, our ancestors were all biologists. They were great biologists. Think how, how great a biologist you had to be to make it 10,000 years ago. Um, so I think that um, in terms of folks being critical thinkers and discerning readers, you know, I, I think as biology teachers, to get them thinking about the centrality of biology to human existence and to our future, food, medicine, water, air, soil, everything. Um, biology is going to be central. The, um, and if we're going to steer this ship um, to our benefit, we got we to gotta, uh, acquire and, and deploy that knowledge. Now, how can you get critical thinkers and discerning readers? It seems like it's, uh, you just got to get them started. I, you know, I don't know how much you can do in a year, but you get them started, you whet their appetite for reading good thinkers. And um, I guess that's where I'd start. And it could start in science or it could start outside of science. And some of your colleagues are, are chiming in. So I'll, I'll leave them to, to finish the answer better. Um, you spoke of the mass extinction after the asteroid hit. Does that mean life formed again or it wasn't a complete extinction? Great question. I want to give you some resources on that because the story is, is, is richer than I could tell in a couple of minutes of a stand-up talk. Um, so when we say about 75% of species went extinct, that means a huge proportion of animal and plant species went extinct. And you got to think about how bad conditions were on earth, especially to drive large numbers of plants extinct, right? Never to be seen again. And in the ocean, tiny little 4Ms, you know, huge mass extinction. But there were survivors. And for example, you think about backboned animals, vertebrates, there were survivors in every class. Mammals made it through, some reptiles made it through, like crocs and turtles. Did okay. Large dinosaurs? No. Birds? There were lots of Cretaceous birds, but four out of the five major lineages went completely extinct. Those that made it were largely like shore birds or kind of burrowing birds. You see the same pattern with mammals, small kind of burrowing creatures. If you think about crocs and turtles, things that are semi-aquatic or fully aquatic can kind of live on detritus, scavenge. So there's a, there is a rationale for who made it through. But then, you know, when conditions started to improve, they inherited a pretty wide open world. And the evidence of that is, I think, most vividly demonstrated in a discovery published just last year in Colorado. And we made a film about it. Um, this is a, a place co called Corral Bluffs that records in beautiful, ama amazingly preserved fossils, plants and animals the first million years of recovery of Earth, as it looked like in, in Colorado, at least. And you see mammals, which were around for 100 million years before the asteroid impact, but small, kind of, you know, small, very small, pound or two. Um, they grew very rapidly in size, very quickly, within a matter of a few hundred thousand years, were far larger than they had ever been before. And they're going to become the largest animals on land and in the seas. Uh, so there's a nova about this called um, Rise of the Mammals that we produced. 
and there's exhibits at the Denver Museum. And um, so for a while there, I couldn't, we couldn't say that much about the recovery of Earth after the asteroid. But now with, the, with locales like this, where we see that first million years, now we can start to kind of put some of the frames of that movie together. So thanks for that question. Now, Jackie's gonna have to like give me a cut sign because I'll, you know, 165 of you are either passed out or still signed in, but I'll, I'll take a few more of these. And, and then at some point we shall return to our families. <laughs> um, yeah, I know you were here. Okay, you guys are awesome. I found myself in the beginning of the pandemic almost grinning, like you said. It's obviously horrible for the morbidity and mortality, but it's hard not to be in awe at nature before our eyes. Is there a mutation you didn't include in the book that you find fascinating? Oh, wow, that's a great question. I mean, I cherry picked because I also try to find those examples that allow me to say something, say the most with the least. Um, I have the mutation that gives you Darwin's pigeons with the crown of feathers. That's one other mutation I talk about in the book. Is there a mutation I didn't include in the book that you find fascinating? Katie, I gotta come back to that because I love all this stuff. Um, you know, I love the mutations that took legs off of snakes. Um, I love the mutations that weaponized venom. Um, that's pretty cool stuff. Uh, but anyway, and I talk about some other mutations in the book, like um, what happened in um, woolly mammoths to adapt to cold weather, how do birds fly at high altitudes, things like this. Just some things that I thought would bring adaptation and, and, and the inventiveness of mutation home to readers. Any other, other tautomers play a role in mutations to allow for other substitutions? I'm pretty sure it's adenine, um, two ring compound, and I think it's, it's kind of a similar story as, as guanine, but don't write that down because for some reason my old brain didn't hold that other base as well. I've been looking at that guanine model too long. How do I approach science deniers? The science deniers this year are responsible for greater than thousands of deaths and continuing. Thank you, Roberta. I think this is really, what a, what a profound challenge. Um, you can imagine how upset it gets me and, and how, as an evolutionary biologist, how long I've dealt with this. Um, but you, you know, we gotta, you gotta figure out, can you, can you get at the root? So Roberta, I've written a new piece for Scientific American. And I think part of it is understanding how the denialism works. And I think there's a playbook, whether it's vaccination, evolution, climate change, mask wearing, whatever you want. Um, there's a playbook and, it's, and I'm, there's gonna be an opinion piece in Scientific American soon, it's, it's in press. Uh, called the denialist playbook. And so part of it is to understand where it's coming from. Um, how do you approach them? Um, you, you sort of have to begin by at least exposing them. And once you get into an argument, you know, it, 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 you know then it looks like, you know, CNN, um, which doesn't seem to have resolved much over these years. Um, so I think, we as, I think we as science educators have to understand, how about I put it this way? I think we as science educators have to understand the phenomenon better. The, fun, the, the basic phenomenon, don't get caught up in the particulars of, you know, in climate change, you know, what's the rate of change in CO2? Is it this amount or whatever? Understand that there's a playbook to all this. It goes, you can see it in the tobacco story from decades ago. It's a common playbook to try to essentially raise doubt about scientific consensus. And it follows a pattern. Thank you, Roberta. Really important topic. And, and maybe I wanna, I, I, this is an area that I might like to do more materials um, with Biointeractive to, to try to get out there. Cause I, I think we need to see it. Um, and, and you know, and some of it is, is, if you think for example about vaccine denial, it really gained ground with the Wakefield story around autism and the MMR vaccine. Now you all know that that's been completely dismantled. The story was fabricated. Um, Wakefield has been, um, his medical credentials have been taken away, et cetera, but the damage has been done for, you know, 20 years plus of, of vaccine hesitancy and, and uncertainty about that linkage. Um, so it's really almost asymmetric. In other words, when you can raise doubt and the scientific community can spend decades piling up a mound of evidence, but somehow our cognitive mechanisms are 
the, the, you know, the way we try to sort of justify ourselves or reinforce these beliefs and not accept new evidence, it, it's really asymmetric. You know, the scientific community will change its mind based on evidence, um, but the denialist community does not. So um, it, it's really asymmetric. Judy asks, are the Tautomers on all four of the bases? And I think it's no, the two, two, two ring compounds, A and G, that are most important, but I'm going to have to issue like a correction to everybody if I'm wrong about that. So thanks asking about the Tautomers. I better sharpen up my Tautomer biochemistry. I've read that article a lot, so I don't know why it didn't sink in. In fact, if I wasn't getting so many questions, I'd quickly put it up on my computer and see what if I could figure it out. Um, those those tautomer driven mutations, great, great question. They're detectable by proofreading mechanisms. Are they more frequently undone than allowed to remain? Yes. So the um, detection of misincorporations and the proofreading functions then reduce the, the um, frequency of mutations that, that persist by four or five orders of magnitude. So this is really the forward reaction to mutation and those proofreading mechanisms bring it back to the mutation rates that we observe, um, the net mutation rates that we see observe in organisms. Great question. I unpack those mechanisms and a little bit of that math in a half page or so in the book. Um, this book, appropriate for the high school freshman? Better for you to judge. Um, uh, I think, I think just the scientifically curious freshmen, yes, those who will not worry. I mean, I'm trying to give the background for anything that anybody might need to, to read the book. Doesn't assume a lot. Um, but I, I think you, you, you are all better judge about audiences. I certainly think lots of the book is completely understandable to a high school freshman. I just wouldn't want them to be, um, discouraged by anything that got a little bit thick. Um, they'll at least enjoy the jokes, I hope. Um, someone who teaches molecular ecosystem scale chance is such a fundamental, oh, here's Jackie. She's gonna give me the hook. Um, short film that ties temporal and spatial scales and chance would be so helpful. Thanks, TJ. Let me, th let me think about that because I was certainly going for that in the book was, was putting those scales together. Okay, Jackie, you wanna give me a countdown here? Because, um, you know, these folks paid good money. <laughs> yeah, the, they they really did. Um, and, it's actually, and it's voluntary and there's 160 of them still. I know, the it's still going strong. Wow. Um, I thought there was actually a question here that I thought would be a good wrap up um, because it is 8.30 East Coast time and everybody's had a long week and we'll all see Sean at the H at HHMI night at the movies at the NEVT conference, he's coming back. Um, but there's a question that says, what is one fundamental concept about evolution do you hope that all students graduating from high school would walk away with? And I'm gonna put high school, intro bio, you know, that last biology class, what is one fundamental concept you'd like them to know? Well, I think the reason I wrote this book is to understand that chance is an inventor. Now that doesn't take natural selection and I'm gonna add all the blah, 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 blah. But We've all, I, this is my message to my fellow teachers. I think we've talked about natural selection a lot. Biologists have talked about natural selection a lot for decades and decades. It was Darwin's baby. And I admire Darwin as much as, or more than anyone on this planet. Um, but we haven't talked about chance much. And I think chance is the, it's almost the more challenging piece of the evolutionary picture. And now that, I mean, let's think of the power. We now can take, the DNA of two parents and a child and precisely identify the mutations that happened in gametes that were not in the parents, right? This is this was, you know, unimaginable a long time ago. So the smoking gun of mutation is it's so easy to pin down now. So um, yeah, I'd like them to understand that that um, that chance is this fuel. Um, that has, that's the source of, as I said, all the beauty and diversity and novelty on the planet. So how about that? I'd love to answer more questions. We'll look for um, whatever happens on movie night, we'll probably be focused on that subject. And folks, do I look forward to all of us being back together in person? And somebody asked, um, if there's a night out, can we all go to the casino and talk chance in biology? And I promise, absolutely. So where's NABT in, in fall of 21? It'll be in Atlanta. Does Atlanta have casinos? I don't think so. 
and it's not near any state line that I think that I can think we can get over very quickly. We'll need to do some research on this. I'm I'm just trying to survive this November. <laughs> yeah. All right, yeah, because there's a. Uh, the MGM Casino here is a, is, a, is a lot of fun. Hey, before I turn it over to you, Jackie, uh, can I can I just mention? Can I wish mm -hmm. Leonard Blessing, long-term NABT member, get this, everybody, his 100th birthday. So, Leonard, feel the love. Happy 100th birthday, and in honor of Leonard's 100th birthday, Jackie. NABT sent out a hundred or well, we'll be sending out a hundred signed books um, of a fortunate series of, or a series of fortunate events um, that we are just going to do what we can to inspire just a few more biology teachers to celebrate all of the work and mentoring that Leonard has done for decades through the NABT community. So with that, on, on behalf of everybody who's sticking around on a Friday night, thank you so much for joining us. But I would like to thank you, Sean, for making this possible, for sharing the book with us. And, um, you know, because it just what came out October 6th? Six, last week. Yeah. So, you know, thank you for putting us on your short list so that we could talk about it. Thank you for answering all of these questions. Um, and thanks for giving all of us something to look forward to. It was a lot of fun. And I know everybody had a fantastic time because they're still sticking around. <laughs> well, I got to say thank you to Jackie. And I got to say thank you to NABT. And I thank all of you because all you've proven tonight is just how awesome teachers are. Fantastic questions. Um, it's Friday night. My goodness, people. I think you deserve some time off. Go relax, please. Oh, I hear about this. How about I share this? Um, two things. How about movie tips? So uh, if you saw Wednesday night's Nova, um, that was us from Tangle Bank. And that was the reintroduction of wild dogs into Gorongosa. So an upbeat tale. But if you've not seen My Octopus Teacher on Netflix, you owe it to yourselves. And I hope, I hope you love it. And please, I also want to just say, if you have comments about chance and about incorporating ch chance into teaching and things you may learn you know, um, from, from teaching, um, please shoot them my way because we're certainly the suggestion box is open. So thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Have a fantastic night. I'm going to sign off, Jackie.